بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمد وأصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد. Most of us, when we think about the idea of the Mahdi, we think about an event that will happen in the future. Let me start off with a very important statement that I want to make: that those of us amongst the Shia, amongst the Shia community, those that are waiting for the Mahdi Muntazir, they will miss him by a mile. And many of the Sunnis, rather dare I say majority of the Sunnis also, will miss him by the mile. Because waiting for someone that you think will like a magic wand make everything good for you, that's not how the Mahdi will look in the real world. And so the question is, what is the Mahdi model? And is the Mahdi model a model for us, therefore, only for that time to come? Or is it model for us in the end of times that you have to emulate this until it manifests itself perfectly and it actually has results? What do I mean by that? Well, in order to understand the Mahdi model, what are the salient features of the model that the Mahdi represents? In order to understand that, those salient features, let's look at one tradition of the Prophet ﷺ and I'll mention a few others and then I'll talk about what we can extrapolate from this hadith in terms of the Mahdi model. Now, let me mention to you that this ver this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that is in Abu Dawud, it has, it ha it can be, it is, you can say the same reoccurring themes are throughout the hadith books, number one. Number two, these are completely congruent with the message of Qur'an, which at the end of this talk that I'm going to give, there is my Juma khutbah that I gave today, that I will add the recording, the audio of that, so please listen to that also. Okay, so now let us look at the hadith that I think is one of the most comprehensive hadith on the issue of the Mahdi. Okay, and so... I will read the Arabic text and then you can see the English text. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yakunu ikhtilaf in the mawtil khalifati, that there will be a disagreement at the occurrence, at the death of a caliph. Now, khalifa here can mean two things. Of course, if it is meaning it in its sharia meaning, then it means the khalifa, like we know khalifa Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. The word Khalifa here, as understood by the Sahabi, meaning its linguistic meaning, which is that one who comes after another. Khalf means ikhtilaf al wa nahar The day and the night, they come after one another. So in the death of a person, after his khalf, after him, there will be a person. Okay. So this is the two different meanings and two different, you can say, opinions. Both of them are valid. One is more valid than the other because... Um, <coughs> the linguistic meaning is probably more valid here. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. Even though I used to have the opinion that uh, the word Khalifa here means in its Shari meaning, in its, in its Islamic meaning of Islamic terminology, that the Muslims would have established Khilafa before the Mahdi. But it seems more appropriate uh, on when you try to look at the bigger picture of the scenario of that time that no, the word Khalifa here doesn't mean uh, in its Shari meaning, but it means it in its linguistic meaning, and Allah knows best. Yakunu ikhtilaf in the al Khalifatin, there will be a disagreement at the death of a king. Okay. Fayakhrudu rajulun min ahlil Madinati. So, a person who will be from Medina, Haribun ila Makkah, he will flee to Makkah from Medina. فَيَأْتِهِ nas, So people will come to him in Ahl al-Makkah. From the people of Makkah will come to him. فَيُخْرِجُونَهُ And they will force him out. وَهُوَ كَارِهٌ And he will be disliking this. فَيُبَايِعُونَهُ And they will force their bayar upon him. بَيْنَ الْرُكْنِ وَالْمَقَامِ Between Rukun and Makkah. وَيَبْأَثُ إِلَيْهِ بَعْثٌ مِنَ الشَّامِ and an army will come against him from Sham. So there will be an army that will try to invade them from Sham. فَيُخْصَفْ بِهِمْ بِالْبَيْضَى And they will be swallowed 
by the earth at that time. بَيْنَ الْمَكَّةِ وَالْمَدِينَةِ While they will be in between Mecca and Medina. إِذَا رَأَ النَّاسِ ذَلِكَ When people will see this sign happen. وَإِذَا رَأَ النَّاسِ ذَلِكَ آتَاهُ أَبْدَالُ الشَّامِ the servants of Allah, the close servants of Allah, they will come to, from Syria, they will come. Even though the army was dispatched against him from Syria, so now these are the good people coming from Syria to Mahdi. وَأَصَائِبُ أَهْلِ Iraq, And a group of the people from Iraq will also come. يُبَايِعُونَهُ بَيْنَ الرُّكْنِ وَالْمَقَامِ And again, he, they, they will, after this event, he will be back in Mecca. They will give bayat to him during between Rukun and Maqam. And then the hadith continues. Okay, And the other part that I'll just mention this in English, disagreement will occur at the death of a caliph or a king. In its linguistic meaning will mean a king. A man from the people of Medina will come fleeing forth to Mecca. Some of the people of Mecca will come to him, bring him out of against his will and swear allegiance to him between the corner and Maqam. A force... A uh, military force will then be sent against him from Syria, but will be swallowed up in the desert between Mecca and Medina. When the people see that the eminent saints of the Abdal of Syria and the best people of Iraq will come to swear allegiance to him between the corner and Maqam, then there will arise a man of Quraysh whose maternal uncles belong to Kalb and send against them another expedition which will be overcome by, by them. And this is the expedition of Kalb. Disappointed will be the one who does not receive the booty of Kalb, meaning the treasures that come from that. He will divide the property and will govern the people according to the Sunnah of the Prophet and establish Islam on earth. He will remain on earth for seven days, uh, seven years or nine years and then die. Now the other hadith that's very, very important on this issue is the one where it mentions that he will bring justice as there was tyranny. There was, he will bring justice as much as there was tyranny, he will bring justice. And that is also well-known traditions of the Prophet, which I'm not going to go into right now. So now I can, after mentioning this hadith, extrapolate from here the, uh, you could say, the Mahdi model. What is the Mahdi model? The Mahdi model is you must be in the form of a jama'ah. The jama'ah must be based upon bay'ah. You must have an emir. And you must establish justice. And you must establish the hukam of Allah, the commandments of Allah, the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, the khilafah upon the earth. When you start, when the Muslims start moving in this direction, when they start gathering together, when like-minded people start gathering together, when people who have three types, this hadith points to three types of people. Number one, a people who are looking to establish the deen of Allah. Number two, a people who want to be close and friends to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it mentions the abdal and the best of the people of Iraq and these are like the, you could say the saints, the abdal. Okay? So they will be, who will be able to identify the Mahdi are not people who are in dreamland. No. People that will be able to identify the Mahdi will be those people who are looking to establish the deen of Allah on earth. Number one. Number two. They will be people whose main purpose in life will be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will organize themselves in the sunnah way and they will establish the deen and they will at that time where they have no choice, they will fight for the deen to establish the deen of Allah. And they will be a people who will know what is justice and injustice, meaning they will not be fooled by secularism. They will not be fooled by democracy. They will not be fooled by perennialism where, oh, all three Abrahamic religions are the same. They will not be fooled by liberalism and false ideas and notions of individualism and consumerism. They won't be these type of, types of people. They will be a people who are willing to live in the middle, middle of the desert outside the fitans outside the main cities, because by that time, Medina and Mecca would have fallen. The Arabian uh, leadership would have fallen. Medina would be desolate, as the Prophet said, وسلم, one day, inshallah, I will show those traditions of the Prophet وسلم, also. Ma Medina will literally become Yathrib. Most of the people would have left Medina at that time. So maybe uh, there's a need to show you that picture that uh, is, is given in the Hadith, 
that most of the people of Medina will leave to jobs outside Medina, even though Medina will be better for them. So Medina will be desolate. Mecca will be desolate. So these are, these are people living outside the cities. And so in order to overcome the fitans, they will go into areas where they will try to live outside the main cities. Let me actually go ahead and uh, show you one of the traditions I just pointed to. So the Prophet said, وسلم, Yemen will be conquered and some people will migrate from Medina and urge their families and those who will obey them will migrate to Yemen. So Madan, Yemen will be taken over. Okay, and, and so these areas around Arabia, Arabia will have fallen. All these areas around uh, Arabia will be taken over. By who? That's a different discussion. Yemen will be conquered and some people migrate from Medina and urge their families and those who will obey them to migrate, although Medina will be better for them if they did but know. Sham will be conquered. And as you know, the Roman armies that will go uh, to capture the Mahdi, uh, they will also be there. Now, Rome is of two types, but I, that is a different discussion for another time. Sham will be conquered and some people migrate from Medina and urge their families and those who will obey them to migrate, although Medina will be better for them if they knew, if they but knew. Iraq will be conquered and some people will migrate to Medina and urge their families and those who will obey them to migrate to Iraq, uh, migrate to Iraq, although Medina will be better for them if they only did but know. Why will it, so these the city of Medina will become desolate? Mecca will be desolate. Why will it become desolate? Because the Prophet ﷺ told us in the very famous tradition of the Prophet, Imran al Bayt al Maqdas Kharab al Yathrib, the destruction, uh, the, the rise and the buildings of Jerusalem will be the destruction of Yathrib. And Yathrib is the name of Medina that the Prophet told us not to call it Yathrib. To call Medina Medina and not to call it Yathrib. Before the Prophet was known as Yathrib. So the Prophet is indicating here that it will go to its pre-Jahiliya days. وَخَرَابُ الْيَثْرِبْ خَرُوجُ الْمَلْحَمَةِ And the, the, the destruction of Yathrib, the destruction of Medina, will be the coming out of the Malhama. Okay, and so uh, the hadith continues. I'm not going to go further. I'm only trying to make the point that three things you have to keep the model in mind. Number one, the establishment of the Khilafah. Number two, that these will be a people who will be outside the city, outside the main areas of... Why will people leave Medina to go to Yemen? Because there will be no income in Medina at that time. Why will they go? Because there'll be a, you can have a better life in Iraq and a better life in Yemen. You can have a better way of life in those areas than in in Medina. It will be more material. The materialism will cause people, and the love of dunya will cause them to leave Medina. And Mecca will already be desolate. That I will come to inshallah at another time. But my main point here is the the, the model. Who will be able to identify the Mahdi? Not people wishfully thinking that Mahdi will come and make everything okay. No. Because they, you have to understand the markers, the main things that help identify. What are they about? And when you understand what they are about, are you doing what they are about? So it's not just about some future event, but it is a guidance. He is the Mahdi. Mahdi means guidance. He is guidance to us that what we should be doing until that time. So that when he does come, you will be able to easily identify with it. So the establishment of the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet means what? The khilafah. So the first people who will be able to identify with the Mahdi will be a people who believe that Islam needs to be established, not secularism, individualism, consumerism, democracy, lib all those other isms. No. The second group of people will be a people who will be understanding that we are in fitans and we need to run from these fitans. And they will either stay in Medina and they will stay in Arabia despite the difficulties and they will not fall at that time, whatever it is. They will not fall for the materialism and technology and the better jobs and the better life at that time. And number three, it will be a people who are 
constantly interested in the idea of becoming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we become the friends of Allah? How can we have spiritual insights? How can we have true dreams that will take us in the right direction? It will be these three types of people, these three types of groups, or you could say these are the three markers within the model of the Mahdi. These are the people that will be able to identify with the Mahdi. There will be things about him, the spiritual minded person will be able to say, okay, I think these people are right. The people who want to establish Khilafah will know he's on the right track because they want to establish Khilafah. And he is establishing justice, just as there was tyranny before. And he will be in a place away from the fitans, away from the major cities, away from Yemen and Iraq, and away from the materialistic and technological world at that time. When you add all these things together, what is the Mahdi model that is giving us guidance today? So this is what, now one aspect of that, or a central aspect of that I want to focus on. The model of the Mahdi, the model of the Mahdi is universal in Islam. The idea of bayah is not new. And I'm not going to talk about, about, about bayah, but I'm going to only talk about one aspect that's central to all of this. And that is having an emir. Having a jama'ah and an amir. Okay? So the Prophet said, وسلم, as you can see in this hadith, wa ati'u. Listen and obey. In alaykum abd habshiyan. Even if wa kana ra'su zabiba. If a man who you think his hair looks ugly takes over you and takes, uh, becomes your amir. If he is forced to become your amir, Listen and obey to your Amir. Number two, so let me give you the English translation. Listen and obey your Amir. Even if an Ethiopian whose head is like a raisin were made your chief. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wasma'u, Wasma'a, Wa'ati'a, Listen and obey. Law abdan, law habshiyan kana ra'su zabiba. Even if an even in another narration, Abdan Habshiyan. This one. Wasma wa wa in istamala alaykum Abdan Habshiyan wa kan ra'su zabiba. Listen and obey. Even if an Ethiopian slave is made your Amir. And in this is a great hint for black people and a bishara to the black people of the Muslim world. There are great leaders like Uthman Danfolio amongst them. And then there are so many, all these narrations are about this same point. Let's go on to the next point. The Prophet said, Man ata'ani faqad ata Allah. Whoever obeyed me has obeyed Allah. Wa man asani faqad asa Allah. And whoever disobeys me has disobeyed Allah. Wa man ata'amiri. And whoever obeyed my Amir, faqad ata'ani, he's obeyed me. وَمَنْ أَصَاءَ مِيْرِي فَقَدْ أَصَاءَنِي And whoever disobeyed my Amir, that I appointed as an Amir, he has disobeyed me. And over here, side point is, the Prophet has, has appointed the Mahdi, whoever he will be as the Amir. But there is another narration in which this Amiri is not used. And the Prophet says, وسلم, and one Sahabi actually corrects this narration and says, the Prophet didn't say my Amir, but he just said Amir in general. You, that narration will come up, inshallah. So over here you have the hadith, and Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man ata'ani faqad ata Allah. Whoever obeys me has obeyed Allah. Wa man asani faqad asa Allah. And whoever disobeyed me has disobeyed Allah. وَمَنْ أَطَى أَمِيرْ الْأَمِيرْ Whoever obeys the Amir, فَقَدْ أَطَاءَنِي Why? Because the Amir is the one, the, because the Prophet's not there. Who's going to be in the position of the Prophet? It will be some Amir. And he's not the Caliph, but he's working to establish the Khilafah. He's the Amir. مَنْ أَطَى مَنْ يُعْطِي الْأَمِيرْ فَقَدْ أَطَاءَنِي Whoever obeys his Amir, he's obeyed me, the Prophet said. وَمَنْ يَعْصِ الْأَمِيرِ Whoever disobeys his Amir, فَقَدْ أَصَاءَنِي He's disobeyed me. إِنَّمَا إِمَامُ الْجُنَّةُ يُقَاتِلُ مِنْ وَرَائِهِ The Imam, he is a shield. 
and people fight behind him. Then the issue comes up that if the Amir is good, then that's good. But what if he's doing things that are not you're not in agreement with, that you find problematic? So the Prophet has also clarified that. فَإِنْ أَمَرَ بِالتَّقْوَى اللَّهِ وَعَدَلَ And if he commands the taqwa of Allah and he does justice, because that's the job of the Amir, to do justice amongst the people. فَإِنَّ لَهُ بِذَلِكَ أَجْرًا Then he will have the ajr of that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِنْ, وإن قَالَ بِغَيْرِ And if he does and he says other than that, فَإِنَّ عَلَيْهِ مِنْهُ Then that is on him. Your job, if there is an Amir, an authentic Amir, by the Islamic model, your job is to obey him. If you disagree on some small issues, no harm. You still have to obey him. Of course, if he does some big ma'asiyah, big uh, blunder, uh, then the issue will be different. The Prophet said, وسلم, من كريها من أميره شيئا If someone sees something about his Amir he dislikes, فليصبر, let him have sabr. ومن خرج من سلطان شبرا مات مية جاهلية Whoever leaves his Amir, even his Sultan, his Amir, and the word Sultan is used for the Mahdi in a Sayyid Hadith. Man kharaja min Sultan Shibran, whoever leaves his Sultan, his Amir, a hand span. Matamiyatan jahiliya. He's died the death of Jahili. The Prophet ﷺ said about Bayah, I don't want to, I'm not talking about Bayah, but the Islamic model of organizing the people is Bayah. That I'll talk about another time which is also is part of the Mahdi model. But first, the idea of the Mahdi is there's an Amir and a Jama'ah. There's Bayah. And the Jama'ah is working for some Islamic causes. This is the basic model. If you don't see this, you believe in presidential democracy or some uh, associations in which there's a board of directors and board of trustees and you never see the Islamic model, you're never going to appreciate the Mahdi when he comes. So the Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi Whoever sees something in his Amir he dislikes, let him have patience. Whoever leaves his Amir for a hand span, he's gone into jahiliyyah. The Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam." Man mata wa laysa Whoever dies, and there's no bayr on his neck. Mata miyatan jahiliya. He's ma- died the death of jahiliya. Baya and Amir, same concept. Now let us continue. The Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, ma min Amirihi shay'an fa yakrahu fal yasbir." Whoever sees something in his Amir he dislikes, let him have sabr. Fa innahu leisa ahadun yufarikul jama'ah. There's no one who leaves the jama'ah. Shibran equal to the hand span. فَيَمُوتُ إِلَّا مَاتَ مِيَةً جَاهِلِيَةً He dies death except nothing except in jahili. Now, let me clarify here something. None of those of us who don't have bay'ah, and we're not under the khilafah, we don't have bay'ah with the khalifa. So either you have bay'ah to work for the khilafah, or you have bay'ah to the khalifa. Otherwise, you're in a state of jahiliyyah. It's like before Islam, there was no efforts being made before the coming of the Prophet for Islam. Either you're in the effort to establish Islam, or you're in the, you have the bayah with the Khalifa and whatever he says, then you go with that. So, disliking something in the Amir is not a reason to leave the Jama'ah. As long as that Jama'ah is essentially, essentially, on the correct path. The only difference is that in the case of the Prophet ﷺ, there can be no dispute, he's the leader. And if there's a khilafa and somebody is chosen as the Khalifa and you don't like him, you also have no choice. You have to accept it. Before the khilafa, you have a choice. But you have to be with some jama'ah, some amir. You don't like something about him, you met him, and when he was praying, he was playing with his beard and he was looking around. You're like, I don't accept him as an Amir. His lectures are very good, but I don't accept him. Okay, you have the right to say that. You don't have the right to say, I won't be with any Jama'ah. And I won't be part of any effort to help Islam. You don't have the right to say that. You have to be part of some Jama'ah. 
that is organized in the model of the Mahdi. The Amir, the Bayah, the Shura, and the goal to establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To get away from the fitans. Let's go on to the next hadith. <coughs> this hadith gives you the complete, you can say, the, the philosophical uh, underpinnings of the whole hadith and the idea of imara or amir. Kullukum ra'yun. All of you are shepherds. All of you are leaders in your own capacity. Kullukum mas'ul, mas'ul an ra'yatihi. All of you are answerable and to be questioned regarding those that you're responsible for. Al Amiru Ra'yun. The Amir, he's like the shepherd taking care of his sheep. He's he's questioned. He can be questioned. Warajulun Ra'yun ala ahli baytihi. And the man he's responsible, he's the leader of his people of his household. Wal Maratu Ra'yatihi ala Bayti Zawjiha. And the the wife, she's the shepherd of the house of her husband, وَوَلَدُهُ and his children. كُلُّكُمْ رَأْيٌ All of you are responsible. وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ أَنْ رَأْيَتِهِ And all of you are, are questioned, to be questioned, for your responsibility. Meaning, both question in the hereafter, and the shura or the jama'ah can question the emir. This is why sometimes one of the words used in the Arab world, for the person who is responsible is mas'ul. He has the mas'ul. He's the one who is questioned. He's the one who can be questioned. Meaning he's the one who is in charge. So the Mahdi will be the Amir. He will be the mas'ul. He will be the ra'i. He will be the shepherd of leading the people. This is the model not only for that time. This is the model of Islam mustaqil, mustaqil but people have forgot it. In this secular world, we don't think about organizing ourselves in an Islamic way. So this is the result. This hadith, I'll just read it in English because it's very clear. The Prophet said, وسلم, when Allah desires a good for an Amir. Now, unfortunately, their translation says ruler. But the word, if you look at the Arabic, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِأَمِيرٍ خَيْرًا If there's an Amir and Allah wants good for him. Meaning, he didn't ask for it. He was pushed into the position of being an Amir. جَعَلَ اللَّهُ وَزِيرَ, وزيرة صِدْقٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him a minister, a somebody who gives him advice that will be truthful. وَإِن ذَكَرَ And if he forgets something, his wazir, his, his, Allah will appoint him somebody close to him who will remind him of things. Okay? وَإِن ذَكَرَ عَانَهُ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help him when he's reminded. And so let me read the English. When Allah desires a good for an emir, Allah appoints for him a sincere advisor who will remind him if he forgets and helps him if he remembers. When Allah wishes on, for him on the contrary, Allah appoints for him a bad advisor. And that's the thing. When you get surrounded by bad people giving you bad advice, you think the, that what you're doing is so great, but they're cheering you on, not knowing everybody else is angry. When Allah wishes for him the contrary, Allah appoints for him a bad advisor who will not remind him if he forgets, nor will he help him if he remembers. Next hadith, the Prophet said, وسلم, a man who is an Amir of ten people. Ma min Amirin. There will be no Amir. Ashratin over ten people. Illa yu'ti yawm al qiyamah. Except he will come on the day of judgment. Maghlulan. Chained. Before Allah. La. لا حتى يؤفك عنه عدل ويوبق جورة. He will not be released until his justice or his criminality is made clear. You're in a meet of ten people. You're going to appear before Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in chains until you prove yourself that you did justice with those ten people. And over here, this hadith is just a side point. An uh, an uh, Abi Bakr, uh, Maulahu, Haddasahu, Kala, Samertu, uh, Samertu Abu Abu Harur, Abu Huraira, Abu Huraira, Radi Allahu, and he said, Yakulu an, an Rasulai, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bidalik, Kala man ata Amir, whoever obeys the Amir, not Amiri, Walam Yakul Amiri, he didn't say my Amir. Any Amir, whoever obeys him, he's obeyed me. So if you have an Amir, and the Amir tells you 
I want you to give the adhan today. It's like you obeyed the Prophet Sallallahu Okay, because he's the head of the jama'ah. And it's just like if you were there and the sahaba were there and the Prophet commanded somebody to give us an adhan, he gave the adhan, he obeyed the Prophet. Now the Prophet is not there. Another normal human being, a sinful human being is there. And after reading this hadith, the one who is in charge of 10 people will come to Allah chained and won't be released until his goodness or badness is made clear. After that, no one should want to be an emir. And so let me end with this hadith and then we'll go back to the discussion of the Mahdi model and then I'll play my Juma khutbah on this thing. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now the, this hadith is by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Man ra'a amirahu shay, uh, amiran yakrahu. Whoever sees in his amir something he dislikes, fal yasbir, let him have sabr. Fa inna laysa ahadun yufariqul jama'a, because no one leaves the jama'a, shibran, even to the hand span, fal yamutu illa ma tamiyatan jahimiya, except he dies the death of jahimiya. Now, I want to end with one more hadith, which is very important in this issue. But before I do that, I want to make this clear. The, one of the first things that in the modern times that went away from the eyesight of the Muslims was the concept of having an Amir and a Jama'ah. As soon as secularism and technology and as soon as this world hit, our way of organizing the people became out of the Sunnah of the Prophet So we have some board of directors, some board of trustees. There's no concept of an Amir and a Jama'ah and Bayah and Shura. People don't know what Shura is. One day, inshallah, I'll talk about that. What is the maqasid, the purpose, the foundations of, on which a Jama'ah is built? What is the function of this Jama'ah? This part of this I'll be mentioning in my Juma khutbah, which I'll attach to this lecture. But let me end with this narration of the Prophet wasallam that has to do with the end of times and the Mahdi model. Okay? Now this hadith deserves a whole lecture on its own, so I am only going to focus on one part of it. When the days of fitan come at the end of times, the Prophet is asked by Hudayfa bin Yaman radiallahu anh, the secret keeper of the Prophet sallallahu When the Prophet was telling us that the Arabs will be in total chaos and they would have left the deen, they will be calling people at the doors of the hellfire. So I will just mention from that part where the Prophet mentions, Nam, du'atun ala abwabi jahannam. They will be calling people to the hellfire. Man ajabahum ilayha fadhuquhu fiha. Whoever answers their call will be thrown into the hellfire. Fakultu ya Rasulullah, sifhum lana. Tell, who are these people that you're talking about? Qala Rasulullah وسلم, the Prophet says, Hum min jildatuna, they will be of our skin. Wa bi alsinatina, and they will talk in our language, Arabic. Qultu ma ya'muruni in adrakani dhalik. What, O Prophet, do you command me to do if this happens? If this happens to come to pass? Dhalik. Iltazim bil jama'a al muslimin. Be with the jama'a of the muslimin wa imamuhum and their imam. If there's no imam in jama'ah where I am, where should I go? The Prophet said, then leave the city. Leave all these groups. All of them. And eat from the roots of the tree until death comes upon me, uh, upon, upon you. And you are upon that way. So, the hukum here is find the jama'ah and find the amir. And so what will the Mahdi be? Mahdi is the ultimate manifestation of that guidance. Okay, so this is what I wanted to clarify for you is that Mahdi is not just some event happening in the future. Mahdi represents a type of guidance for the end of times to be with the amir and with the jama'ah and to be outside the city. And to be with those people that want to establish the deen of Allah, the khilafah. And to be with those people that want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now with this, inshallah, I will attach my Juma khutbah for today if I can. Okay, jazakumullah khairan. And inshallah now, as-salamu alaykum. Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasul al-kareem. Amma ba'd. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Huwa al-ladhi arsala rasulahu bil-huda wa deen al-haq. ليظهره على الدين كله 
وقال عز وجل هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين وقال عز وجل وعد الله الذين آمنوا منكم وعملوا الصالحات ليستخلفنهم في الأرض كما استخلف الذين من قبلهم ولا يمكنن لهم دينهم الذي ارتضى لهم ولا يبدلن من بعد خوفهم أمنا يعبدونني لا يشركوا بي شيئا ومن كفر بعد ذلك فأولئك هم الفاسقون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل العقدة من لساني يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورفنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورفنا اجتنابا اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى اللهم آمين يا رب العالم Today I want to talk about the obligation, the fardiyya, the obligation for the Muslims to establish the khilafah. The obligation for Muslims, the obligation for Muslims to establish their own political, economic, social, just order. The obligation, the obligation, the fardiyya of the Muslims to establish a society that is representative of the Islamic teachings at the political, economic, judicial level. We live in a time where we cannot point to one inch of the surface of the earth where we can say, this is Islam. Not one inch. The earth belongs to Allah. The earth belongs to Allah. But in this whole of the earth, you can't point to one inch where you can say that this is the place where Allah is supreme by the hands of the believers. Meaning Allah is supreme no matter what, but not by the hands of the believers. Because wherever the believers are, the laws, the social norms, the value structure is all anti-Islamic. And today it has come to such a point that the Prophet forbade non-Muslims from entering into Mecca and Medina. And all of the four mazahibs agree that non-Muslims cannot enter Mecca and Medina. Some of the Imam Abu Hanifa, his opinion is, or some of the Ahnaf, their opinion is, somebody can enter Medina for trade, but only for trade purposes and then leave. And even that under special conditions. Because as you know, Medina was Darul Khilafah. It was the center of the Khilafah. It was the central city, one of the central cities of Islam. But what happened yesterday, a Jewish journalist goes into Mecca and takes pictures and says, my dream has come true. But this is not a big deal, so what? This is just to express how far things have fallen. When the Prophet ﷺ, when he became the Prophet of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, 
If you were to study his life in secular terms, from the perspective of how did the Prophet, and this is a very important question, how did the Prophet accomplish and what did he accomplish? Let me, I've said this before, but I want to put this in a different perspective today. The Russian Revolution came, the Bolshevik Revolution came in the world. What did it change? It changed the economic system, communism came. The Chinese Revolution, Mao came, what changed? The economic system came. The French Revolution came, what changed? The political system, it was monarchy and then it became democracy. Every time there has been a revolution in any society throughout the entire history of mankind. I'm not saying this emotionally. I'm not saying this emotionally. I'm saying this intellectually. Any time any revolution came in any place at any time in human history, it was always a partial revolution. Maybe the economic system changed. Maybe the monarchy system changed. Maybe the social system and the social dynamics changed. But never, ever, ever in history did it ever happen at any point, at any time, that the political, social, judicial, Economic order completely changed. This never happened. The only person on the surface of the earth, the only man on the surface of the earth in the human history that ever changed all three major aspects of any social order, the political system, the economic system, the social system, the only man that ever changed all three aspects of society was no, none, other, none other than Nabi Muhammad Therefore, if you want to understand the idea of social change, how does society change? How do social transformations happen? How do societies become better or for that matter, for worse? How do transformations of not just individuals, but at the social level take place? There's no man better to study than Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu So why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bring about such a big revolutionary change where he changed the political system, the social order, the economic. Why did he do this? Why was there a need to do this? Why was there a need to change the entire system? Why not just come and give them the aqaid, the belief system and say, this is what you have to believe. I'm going and leave the economic, social, judicial order intact. Why did he have to change everything? And the answer is because he was going to be the last Prophet. He was going to be Khatimun Nabiyyin, the last role model given to humanity. So his change had to be the most comprehensive and dynamic. And Because Muhammad sallam, is one of the four prophets or three prophets sent to all of humanity. You can say Adam was sent to all of humanity. He's Abu of every one of us. And Ibrahim, Imam al-Nas, inni ja'iluka lil-nasi imama. Allah says to Ibrahim, I'm going to make you the imam of the people. And then also we can say, Adiathani, Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, he was also sent to all of mankind. But then finally, the Prophet sallallahu Over here, I want to add another dimension to this.
discussion. And this is a very important point. Please mind this point. Because we have a lot of, you know, khutb and nabuat conferences or the Prophet is the last Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a lot of conferences, but this point is not highlighted about the Prophet. And that is that every Prophet came with some laws, some, some new law for that society. But society was changing, was evolving. First, you can say we were in nomadic society or in a, we were living in the cave. Then after that, we became tribal society, then multi-tribal society, then into like city-states, and then finally empires. So this is the awe, this kind of like evolution was taking place. So when, for example, Musa والسلام, came, he couldn't give complicated economic rules because society was his tribal. He had the Ten Commandments, very simple. Live by these Ten Commandments, you have a simple society, you live in a tribal society, you live by the Ten Commandments, good enough. But the details of what is riba and what is bay salam and all of these different types of uh, transactions Islam allows, they, they couldn't even understand that. They weren't even in a position to understand that. So as each prophet was coming, new additions were being added that were not there previously. This is the meaning of the ayah, al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenam. Today I have perfected your deen, meaning it was akmal. You know, akmal means, you know, to reach a conclusion, a high point, perfection. So there was a process starting with Adam. And as society was evolving, new laws were being given, new laws were being given. Then another prophet comes, new laws are being given. Musa comes, Isa comes. And then finally, Prophet Muhammad get, comes and then he gets and receives the final culmination of Allah's will on earth. But it was not enough to say you have to live by these rules. You have to live by these social values. You have to live by these social norms. That was not enough. Because the Prophet ﷺ was the last Prophet of Allah, he had to actually establish it and show it to people that, oh mankind, look, this is what Islam looks like. This is how Islam functions. This is Islam in practice. Not just theory, but this is Islam in practice. So he first established the city of Medina, which was not an, a state yet. It didn't have the status of being a proper state, as some people conclude. Because Fathul Makkah and after that, Fathul Makkah is when the Prophet take, took over Arabia in the real sense of the word. But the Prophet established the system and he established a place where there's la fadla li arabin ala ajami wa la ajami ala arabi wa la aswad ala ahmar etc etc as the prophet said sallallahu alaihi there's no fadila of the arab over the non arab or the non arab over the arab or the black over the white or the white over the black or in some hadith the prophet says red over the so the prophet established that social just order Now the question is, how did he do it? And what does it mean for you and me? How does it relate to me and you today? The first thing is, whenever any da'i, now when I use the word da'i, I mean it in the secular sense. Anyone who's making a call, anyone who says, I have, I'm inviting you to some ideas, it could be Marxism, could be democracy, could be capitalism, could be Islam, could be anything. When anybody has any ideology, any ideas, any da'i is calling anyone towards anything, he first has to have something he's calling to. Number two, after that, after ideology, after your iman, you can say, you have to have some mechanism of organizing the people, disciplining the people, teaching the people, doing tarbiyah of the people, 
this you can say is da'wa and then tazkiyah. And this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions four times regarding the second point and three times regarding the first point in the Quran. And Shawlila Muhaddas Zilbi, as I've said it before, because it can't be emphasized enough. Shawlila Muhaddas Zilbi considered this ayah that I'm about to read to you the most important ayah of understanding the seerah of the Prophet. And the most important ayah in order to understand the Quran, which is that. Allah sent his Nabi Muhammad وسلم, with Al Huda, the Quran, with Deen al Haq, and that true just order, that system of light that is based upon justice and fair play. Allah sent him for what reason? To make that way of life, to make that social just order, the supreme way of living. In Surah Al-Hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We sent our messengers already with clear signs. And we sent down with them the book of Allah. And we sent down with them the mizan. What is right? What is wrong? For what reason Allah sent his message? What reason? What is one of, and this is one of the other things that's missing in our dialogue about prophethood. There's a lot of emphasis on the prophet is Bashira wa Nadira. He gives the good news and he warns the people. But if you look at the Quran and read the Quran over and over again, the Quran mentions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spent, sent the Prophet for what reason? <inaudible> to put people upon justice. We already sent our message. <inaudible> to put people upon justice. <inaudible> and we've sent down the iron. It has many benefits for mankind. But the real purpose, So Allah will know who helps Allah and His Messenger in the unseen. In Surah Shura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in four ways, you know when there's a hukum in Quran, when there's a command in the Quran, Allah says something in the form of a command. Like, aqimu salah is a command. Is a command. And a command of Allah is qat'i. It's absolute. It cannot be. It's, it has the status in Islamic law of being a fard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shara'a lakum min ad-deen. We have made it clear for you of the deen. Shara'a lakum min ad-deen ma wasla bihi nuhan wal ladhi awhayna ilayk. We have made it part of your sharia. As we made it part of the Sharia of Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam, Shara'a lakum min ad-deeni ma wasla bihi nuhan wal ladhi awhayna ilayk. Well, wa ma wasayna, and what we made a faridah, a fard upon. Wa ma wasayna bihi Ibrahima wa Musa wa Isa. And the same thing that was made fard upon Ibrahim and Musa and Isa. What? An aqimu ad-deen. Establish the deen. You have great ideas? Islam is a great idea? Where is it to be seen? Is there one inch in the face of the earth you can say this is Islam? Shara'a lakum min ad-deen ma wasla bihi nuhan wal ladhi awhayna ilayk wa ma wasayna bihi Ibrahim wa Musa wa Isa an aqimu ad-deen wa la tatafarraqu fi and have no disputes about this. Establish the deen. Then what does Allah say? Qul amanta ma O Prophet وسلم, say to them, I have been commanded to believe in whatever book has been sent to me. And I have been sent to do justice amongst you. Now I'm tying this with what is the biggest statement when you collect all of the ahadiths about the Mahdi when he comes? What is the most interesting statement that is repeated about the Mahdi over and over and over and over again 
in every narration about the Mahdi. What will he do? He will bring justice upon the earth just as it was filled with tyranny before. What does that mean for me and you? It means that we have to follow the same model. We have to have an ideology we call people towards. We have to organize the people in the form of a jama'ah. You cannot resist the fitans of the world. You cannot resist the temptations and the tricks without creating a society within a society. Without a jama'ah, without an amir, without a shura. You can't create the type of wall you need, a bubble around you, the a type of bubble around you where you live in your own world without like-minded being people to being together. It can't be done. And that was the first step the Prophet took وسلم, in his sirah. He invited the people. After he invited the people, he trained them. This verse of the Quran comes four times regarding the same issue. It is Allah who raised a messenger amongst them. What does he do? He recites to them the ayat of Allah. He teaches them the Quran. What is Quran? Quran is our worldview. Quran is our ideology. And then he purifies them. How? Through this book. Teaches them the ideology in this book. Purifies them via this book. Then, in addition to taking away their arrogance and their jahiliya, And he teaches them the book, meaning what? What is halal, what is haram? What you can eat, what you can't eat? What you can take, what you can't take? What are the obligations on you? What are the obligations against you? And finally, he teaches them the hikmah, the wisdom of Quran. Yaseen wal Quran al Hakim. Call them to Islam, train them, purify them, organize them, discipline them. This is the only way to resist. The only way to resist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in very beautiful words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya amanu, O you people who believe, who claim to believe, kunu ansar Allah, become helpers of Allah. Kama qala Isa ibn Maryam, like Isa alayhi salatu wa salam, he said to his disciples, what did he say to them? The Muslims, of that time had turned against the Nubuwa of Isa alayhi And on top of the Muslims was the Roman Empire also dictating to the Muslims what to do. There's a very similar situation to ours today. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, O you people who claim to believe, kunu ansar Allah, become helpers of Allah. Every Muslim should feel. Every Muslim must feel. What can I do to help the cause of what can I do to help Islam? What can I help to help the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Ya ansar Allah, kama qala Isa ibn Maryam, like Isa ibn Maryam, he said to his disciples, man ansari ila Allah, who's going to be my helper in the cause of Allah? Come join. Come in what? Join. Join hands with Man ansari Allah. Qal al Hawariyun. The disciples said, Nahnu ansar Allah. We are the helpers of Allah. So Allah says, What happened? Fa'amana ta'ifatun bin bani Israel wa kafara ta'ifa. So a people, a group of the people believed in Isa. And a people of them, a group of them rejected. 
But who did Allah help? Who did Allah give victory to? We supported the people who helped Isa والسلام, and they became dominant over their, their and, and the people that were opposing Isa Same thing for us. The Prophet comes, the Prophet makes a call. When you accept the call, then you go through the process of training. Your tazkiyah is done. You're organized. Like-minded people are put together. And then this becomes a wall against that fitna that is out there. The temptation, the difficulties. The, it is easier for the person in the time of the Prophet who is accepting Islam to become Muslim if he knows Omar bin Khattab and Hamza and the others are with me. If I'm just alone, I'll be eaten up. So number one, the goal of every Muslim should be, how can I help Islam? Number two, every Muslim must get organized in some shape or form. If you're alone, shaitan is with the one who is alone. You must get organized in some shape or form. And number three, the ultimate, ultimate goal is what? Is to establish the social political order it may not happen in our lifetime it may happen through the hands of the mahdi or it may happen in some other shape and form but the ultimate goal is the will of allah be done on earth as it is in the heavens the deen of allah is established for humanity to see this is what islam is but it all starts for me and you if you're just alone and you're not in a jama'ah, you don't have an ideology, you don't have a belief system that you're reminded about again and again and dhikr and dhikr and dhikr over and over again. If you're not reminded and you're not organized, you're going to go with the winds of society ultimately. The micro trends of society or the macro trends of society will take you in the wrong direction. And then when you organize the people, when you train the people, and you have created a bubble within that society, when you've created a jama'ah or a society within society, when you've created that, what is the job of that group? Let me very quickly end with these two verses of the Quran. You can say these three verses of the Quran are a three-point agenda for the Muslim Ummah. And I'll end with this. Three ayahs, three agenda points, and three verses of the Quran. Qala Allah Ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you people who believe, ittakullaha haqqa tuqatih. This is, you can say, these three ayahs are like a complete khutbah to the Muslim Ummah. This is what you have to do. O you people who believe, have taqwa of Allah. What is taqwa of Allah? It is the belief. That if you do something wrong, Allah can take action against you. In this life or the next life. This is taqwa. Taqwa is to believe Allah is powerful. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take action against your wrong action. And Allah will take action against your wrong action. Either in this life or the next life. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you people who claim to believe, ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi, fear Allah as he ought to be feared. This awareness that if I do something on purpose to displease him, there can be a reaction to that. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. And your goal should be to not die except you've completely surrendered to Allah as a Muslim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Point number one. It's getting hot, so I'm going to try to make it quick, inshallah. Number two, wa'atasimu bi hablillahi jami'ahu wa la tafarratu. Hold on to the rope of Allah and do not be divided. What is the rope of Allah, the Qur'an? The Qur'an will 
glue you together. Quran is the glue of the Ummah. If somebody is reciting Quran very beautifully, you're enjoying the Quran, no one's asking, is he Salafi, is he Sufi, is he this, is he Deobandi? No, beautiful Quran, okay. Quran is the glue by which the Prophet وسلم, glued the people together. And number two, remember the favor upon you about sending Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to you. When you were enemies,